Nobody thought a thing like this was possible. A pandemic that affected every single person on the planet. Why didn't anyone stop this? For weeks and weeks, the Chinese government kept us silent. This is the result of taking a natural virus and mucking around with it. Hey, presto, the perfect human pathogen. That actually would make a good bioweapon. It escaped from the lab. They had had an accident. The first cluster worked into Wuhan Institute of Virology. They silenced journalists and disappeared some of them. It won't stop there. What led you to believe this came from a Wuhan lab? It was obvious there were body bags. COVID-19. Like you, it wasn't until early 2020 that I started paying attention to this. Then came the investigation, then came the revelations, and then the writing. Tonight, join me as I tell you what I've discovered about where the virus came from and when it first appeared. Mr. President, welcome. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. You've seen all of the intelligence. When do you think the virus first started? Well, some of the intelligence is classified, and I can't talk about it, but common sense tells you it most likely, and when I say most likely, like 95% came from the Wuhan lab. Uh, I don't know if they had bad thoughts or whether it was gross incompetence, but one way or the other, it came out of Wuhan and it came from the Wuhan lab. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for His Excellency Xi Jinping, General Secretary of the CPC Central Committee, President of the People's Republic of China, and Chairman of the Central Military Commission. They're the Olympic Games for military athletes. Held every four years, Wuhan was the host city in 2019. And I didn't even know about the military games until someone from the Army uh, called me in, in December of 2020 and asked me if I could explain what happened at the Wuhan military games and whether these people had fallen sick with an early uh, uh, strain, uh, emerging strain of COVID. As the site of a potential virus superspreader, it doesn't get much bigger than this. And in the weeks and months that followed, reports emerged of athletes becoming sick. It, it is suspicious. I mean, we, we do see some indications in our own data, you know, that NIH has, that there was COVID circulating in the United States, certainly at the earliest month, of, you know, as early as early December, possibly earlier than that. I mean, some of these work, these people who came back from those games were sick with something. People got sick. I believe their French uh, athletes got sick. I believe their Germans. Uh, some Americans got sick too. But getting sick in Wuhan, in that particular time frame, of the kind of symptoms that were very similar to what would later known to be coronavirus symptoms, uh, that obviously deserve investigation. No one was ever tested, but there was one man who knew something was wrong. China's most famous defector to the United States, the father of his country's democracy movement. I thought that the Chinese government would take this opportunity to spread the virus during the military games as many foreigners would show up there. Wei Jingsheng spent 18 years in Chinese prisons for standing up to Beijing. In 97, he made global headlines when he defected to the United States. Wei still has impeccable contacts high up in the party, and they were telling him a virus was spreading in Wuhan in October. David Asher is a veteran weapons investigator. He led a US government task force into the origins of COVID-19. 
and in late 2020, he unearthed intelligence that Wuhan Institute of Virology scientists fell sick with COVID-like symptoms. But what alarmed him was just how long Washington had sat on this classified intel. I was very surprised at the level of detail that they were able to produce uh, around information that they had uh, probably collected well over a year before that. So in November uh, of 2020, we learned things that they had collected in November 2019. Wuhan is located in the central Chinese province of Hubei. It's home to 11 million people. Also in this sprawling metropolis is one of the world's leading biological research facilities the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It was built by the French and included a cooperation agreement, which meant that French scientists would be included in the research groups in Wuhan and that they would work together on this virological research. By the end of 2014, they had effectively excluded all the French that were in the Institute. And, you know, the suspicion on the part of the French was that, you know, the, 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 they were pushed out because of the Chinese military interest in the work. Well, so what we, we, we do know, I mean, is, is that they were one of the world's leading repository of uh, coronaviruses. That research was headed up by Shi Zheng Li. They call her the Batwoman. She's China's top virologist, and her specialty, bat viruses. In 2012, Shi Zheng Li hit pay dirt. At a disused mine in southwestern China, six workers fell ill after clearing away bat manure. Three died from a coronavirus. But Beijing covered it up and told no one. That mine was a gold mine, pardon the pun, for new viruses to study. And they've returned to it at least five times, the Mojiang mine. That's what Xi Jinping has been doing for two decades. She's been going around various bat caves, mostly in Yunnan, China, and collecting bat viruses. Hundreds of samples were brought back to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. There, scientists were slicing, manipulating, and combining genetic sequences from different viruses together. RATG13 is the name of one coronavirus they extracted from the bats in those caves. It is 96.2% identical to the virus that causes COVID-19. Then the natural question is, did they find COVID-19 on one of those trips? And if so, why haven't they told us about it? Um, or did they manipulate, uh, you know, Rat G13 or one of the other coronaviruses that they found in this cave? and that created COVID-19. And of course, that's always raises the question, well, how far did they push the boundaries? You know, what, what research were they doing? For weeks and weeks, the Chinese government uh, kept silent on the outbreak. They're not saying anything, as if nothing is happening. So citizen journalists, are beginning to send out their videos and reports and hospital uh, situation reports on a daily basis. One of those citizen journalists is Chen Kuishi. He's also a lawyer. Chen had heard China was covering up the unfolding tragedy in Wuhan. So he went there and started posting videos. Chen 
，官方已经辟谣了，但是真的。And then he disappeared. Mr. President, what evidence were you presented with that convinced you that it did, in all likelihood, come from a lab? Well, I started hearing stories that you have also, that there were lots of body bags outside of the lab, and people were saying there are a lot of people lying down on the streets of Wuhan, and there were body bags. Body bags outside of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I heard that a long time ago, and if they did in fact have body bags, that was one little indication, wasn't it? There was an, an enormous. Albeit indirect evidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the center point for this. Remember too, there were 14 American diplomats on the ground in Wuhan at this time, who were watching and observing what was taking place inside of Wuhan. I, I hope one day that we'll be able to get that information out more broadly. But I, as I come back to it, the cumulative evidence that one can see points singularly to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. If there was really no blame here, if this was really just some naturally occurring virus because someone ate a bat from a wet market, China wouldn't have done the things that they did. The Chinese Communist Party would not have shut down Wuhan. They would not have silenced doctors and scientists and journalists and disappeared some of them. John Ratcliffe was the United States Director of National Intelligence, the Overlord. Of 18 different agencies. When did the intelligence community first become aware that there was a virus spreading in Wuhan? You know, in late、uh, 2019, we have intelligence from both, you know, human intelligence sources and signals intelligence sources. And other intelligence sources that that were telling us that that there was some sort of a problem in in Wuhan. Key to that assessment was intelligence that three people working in the Wuhan Institute of Virology had become sick in October 2019. This was well before the first official case was eventually announced in late December. Do you believe that to be the first cluster of the pandemic? Based on everything I've seen, this is the first cluster. I have seen no evidence that there's a cluster that began any place but this. I am all ears to see of any evidence that presents some some back set to the contrary. Which raises the question: If U.S. intelligence knew there was a virus in Wuhan in late 2019, why didn't they do anything about it? Was this an intelligence failure? We had the means to know something, but we didn't either analyze it or disseminate it. Or even know that it was collected. I always worry about that. As the former director of the CIA, I was always worried that we were collecting information, but we weren't able to process it sufficiently timely and get that information to the right places. One of those people who was reported to have disappeared was Huan Yang Lin. Is she one of the ones that we believe fell sick with COVID-19? I don't know、uh, her status,、um, but.、Uh... You know the information that you're talking about that's out in the public domain is consistent with what I've seen and what I'm familiar with. Huan Yang Lin was a researcher at the institute. In early 2020, she disappeared from its website. Her social media presence also vanished. Despite Beijing's denials, many believe Huang was infected with COVID-19. She's never been seen since. Making people disappear is actually a major feature of the regime. I mean,、uh, it's actually truly a People's Republic of disappearances. <laughs> Dissidents,、uh, uh, journalists, and anybody the government doesn't like, they disappear. They disappear into oblivion、um, forever. This is basically a, a regime that is not only capable of doing these things and then do this with great pride. And it's not only people that go missing. On the 12th of September 2019, the virus database at the Wuhan Institute of Virology was taken offline. 22,000 coronavirus samples gone.
And that very same day, the Institute beefed up its security and issued a tender to replace its air conditioning system. This, in September, is when the evidence suggests a leak first occurred. And a month later, the Institute went into a communications blackout. There was no cell phone or signals activity on the compound for about two weeks. How significant would a, a blackout period at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, as has been reported, how significant would that be? Again, it would be another um, circumstance that would be difficult to explain other than there was a problem that the Chinese Communist Party was aware of and was trying to deal with before, uh, you know, it became an outbreak that was public and then ultimately a pandemic that affected every single person on the planet. This video was part of the official launch of the Wuhan Institute of Virology's latest lab, BSL-4. It clearly shows there were bats in the lab. And that's a fact World Health Organization investigators said was a conspiracy. When it, the outbreak happened, uh, a lot of people noticed that it's quite a coincidence that it happened in the same city where there's this premier lab studying coronaviruses. And, you know, people were saying, well, that's suspicious. And everybody who, th who said there could be more to it, they were called conspiracy theorists. Yuri Dagan is a genetic engineer. From Moscow, he watched COVID-19 spreading around the world. In April 2020, Yuri wrote an essay arguing that the animal-to-human theory just didn't stack up. Can you detail some of the issues that you uncovered in that Medium paper that were just so crucial? Basically, it's that the Wuhan Institute of Virology that is located at the same, at the epicenter of the outbreak, has been creating uh, chimeric genetically modified coronaviruses for many, many years. And they've been uh, putting uh, these spike proteins from different viruses in their backbones and then studying like how well does that infect human cells. Just this alone forms a very plausible argument that this is actually the lab that hosts so many different coronaviruses uh, explains the lab leak uh, the best. Yuri, this was highly risky coronavirus research that was happening at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and no one seemed to be paying any attention to it. Yes, this kind of work of very dangerous, potentially pandemic pathogens, you know, being made more transmissible and potentially more lethal to humans, nobody paid attention to it because nobody cared about this kind of work in virology until the outbreak happened. So Richard Dearlove also ran into resistance to the lab leak theory. He's the former head of the British spy agency, MI6. Early in the pandemic, two scientists asked for his help in publishing a paper that cast doubt on COVID-19 coming from an infected animal. We approached nature, we approached science, we approached the American Journal of Virology, we approached various publications in the UK, and it was clear to me um, that there was a sort of united front not to put anything in the public domain um, which questioned um, the Chinese narrative. Another paper that struggled to find a home was from Professor Petrovsky. His research found the virus was better adapted to infect humans than any other animal, including bats. We were quite stunned when we just got rejection after rejection after rejection without even the paper being looked at. We must hold accountable the nation which unleashed this plague onto the world, China. 
you could say that the Trump factor contaminated the argument quite seriously. And I think there were a significant number of prominent scientists who did not want publicly to appear to be supporting Trump. In early 2020, the medical journal The Lancet published a letter from a group of scientists saying the lab leak was a conspiracy. The man behind the letter was Peter Daszak. He's the president of EcoHealth Alliance, and he'd been working with the Wuhan Institute of Virology for 15 years, sending US grant money to Wuhan for bat research. We looked at what certain scientists were saying, matching it with intelligence, and when it didn't match up, we were questioning it. But then we were, as we looked more closely at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, you know, what a lot of scientists like Dr. Fauci and Peter Daszak were saying was, there's no live bats there. There's no um, gain of function research there. There's no military there. And we had intelligence that was telling us that all of those things were occurring there. It took more than 12 months from the start of the pandemic for the World Health Organization to finally send a team to Wuhan to investigate the origins of the virus. The US submitted the names of three officials, but one they didn't suggest was picked, Peter Daszak. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. Uh, the, the Dashik was the guy. He was incredibly compromised in that sense. He should have recused himself. He should have said, nope, I can't be part of that. I, I was connected to this. I, had, I was involved in the funding of things that were taking place at this laboratory. It made no sense to put him on that group. He should have seen that himself. And certainly the leaders who were making the decisions about who to have be part of that commission should have seen that this conflict of interest would deny their report, whatever it was they were going to put out, the credibility that I know they hoped that they would have. As to the possibility of COVID-19 coming from a lab, the WHO report found it extremely unlikely. Well, the WHO is controlled by China. I dropped out of the, the World Health Organization. I thought it was ridiculous. They were late. They were wrong. They advised against travel restrictions. They, they objected to your travel ban from China. Well, they really did what China told them to do, if you think about it. They were like a mouthpiece for China. Before the pandemic, much of the world had never heard of the term gain of function. Put simply, it's genetically manipulating a virus to give it new functions, like the ability to infect humans. That's what was happening inside the Wuhan lab. For those who keep bringing up you know, the possibility of a bat in, in the wild markets in, in Wuhan having been the source of COVID-19. Scientifically, that has, has really no merit because it can't infect bats. So, so it couldn't have come straight across from a bat if it can't infect a bat. Dr. Anthony Fauci is America's top medical advisor. I found a scientific paper he wrote in 2012 where he argued the benefits of gain-of-function research were worth the risk of a pandemic. In total, American agencies funded 65 research projects at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So you don't want to go to Hoboken, New Jersey or to Fairfax, Virginia to be studying the bat-human interface that might lead to an outbreak. So you go to China. I've seen very little evidence to date that there was a broad-based inf information exchange before the decision was made by Dr. Fauci to lift that ban on gain-of-function research. We now know from emails that have been released under the Freedom of Information Act that he was getting his advice from the likes of Peter Daszak, a Wuhan collaborator. At the same time, he was telling you that this was a natural virus, while at the same time, behind the scenes in emails, he was having discussions about whether this might have been genetically manipulated. Does that shock you? Well, he was dealing with them, certainly, and my thing was a little bit different. I just wanted to stop it. Uh, whether it developed one way or the other, I just wanted to stop it. 
Why did you allow the gain-of-function research to continue? Well, I think probably people that worked for me looked at it, and at one point they might have uh, done that. But ultimately, what we did was we shut it off. We shut the whole thing off, and we stopped making payments that were approved much earlier than our administration. While writing my book, I discovered a crucial piece of the COVID-19 puzzle. Cybersecurity analysts at Internet 2.0 recovered Chinese government data that had been virtually wiped from the web. It showed there was a buy-up of PCR equipment used to test for coronaviruses in Wuhan in 2019. The next month, one of those machines went to the Wuhan Institute. Is this something you're aware of, that they bought a PCR machine in November 2019? I wouldn't be able to comment on that. How significant would this purchase be? Would be significant. Is it a smoking gun? U ultimately, I don't think there's ever going to be one specific smoking gun. Um, I think there's um, more than just smoke here. I think there's fire from a whole bunch of different sources. Do you think SARS-CoV-2 was developed as a bioweapon? So... I'd like to think it wasn't, and I'll probably have to leave it at that because I want to give the benefit of a doubt, and China was also affected by it. So I really don't think it was, but nobody can really know for sure, and certainly now most of that evidence is gone, and it's going to be very hard to find out. My concern was that the Chinese were doing research in, uh, as we learned later, quite uncontrolled circumstances that was most definitely related to biological warfare ambitions in the future, and that they had had an accident of a secretive program that they never wanted anyone to know about uh, because it was a weapon, and, and the weapon had gotten uh, released errantly. I mean, it was like someone dropping a nuclear weapon out the back of a B-52 and bombing some city and saying, whoops, uh, we didn't mean for that to occur. Do you think this was an accidental or deliberate release of COVID-19 from China? So I think it was probably an accident. I don't think it was uh, on purpose. If it was, that's essentially war. Is there still major intelligence that goes to proving the virus came out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology that's still not in the public domain? Yes, there's compelling intelligence that hasn't been declassified. When you declassify intelligence, you, you, you risked, you know, the potential human sources or signals intelligence where your, where your eyes and ears into the, to their actions are coming from. And so we put out as much as we felt we could safely do um, at the time. But I think the time has come for the Biden administration to declassify additional information that would, again, um, uh, more evidence if you need it that, that Chinese Communist Party officials acted badly, bullied international officials, um, covered up intelligence and reporting on this. Um, there is more intelligence out there, and I'd like to see it uh, declassified, because it'll create additional pressure, not just on Chinese Communist Party officials, but others that still continue to deny that China is a bad actor here. Is this what the future looks like? If this virus is allowed to spread and disseminate, it's going to learn more tricks. Uh, it's going to become more infectious because that's the way viruses travel. Uh, they're opportunists. Uh, and it's going to reach a point where we'll never actually free ourselves because it's found we're such a wonderful host species, it doesn't ever want to leave. The, the people that had the most access to the most intelligence are telling you that the most likely origin of, of COVID-19, of the Wuhan virus, was what happened, was a lab leak at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. This is really most likely what happened. And it's more than just a possibility. It's certainly a probability, and it's probably a certainty. The other thing that the cover-up tells you is the absolute absence of humanity of these leaders. They are willing to allow people to die. They don't care about human life. They don't value them the way the people in the West, in the United States and Australia do. They are prepared to let millions of people die if that's what it takes to protect their regime.